Marie Oling was born on August 6, 1999 to parents Tiffany Young and Jason Oling. At the age of 20, she was living with her father Jason and stepmother Robin in New Wilmington, Pennsylvania, and at other times with her mother Tiffany in Etna, Pennsylvania. At one point, she began seeing a man twice her age named Michael David Mano of Penn Hills, Pennsylvania. Mano was a handyman and felon, convicted of 13 felonies in Pennsylvania alone, consisting of arson, theft, auto theft, statutory sexual assault, reckless endangerment, corruption of minors, and aggravated assault. He also has charges in several other states, including an alleged attempted homicide. Kayleen and Michael broke up, and she wanted the jewelry back from him that belonged to her grandmother. She didn't own a car, and a plan was made for him to meet her to get the jewelry. On the evening of January 9, 2020, Kayleen was at the home of her friends Courtney and David in Etna, Pennsylvania. At 1.36 the next morning, January 10th, a message was sent to her mother from her phone stating that she would be there at 9.30 to babysit her younger siblings. She then posted on Facebook that before she and Mano broke up, he had committed another robbery at a laundromat. Soon after the text was sent to her mother and the post put on her Facebook page, she walked down the street to meet Mano, where he reportedly admitted to picking her up. Sadly, she has never been heard from again, despite Mano claiming to have dropped her back off at the same place he picked her up from. Kayleen's mother grew concerned when she didn't show up to babysit that morning and filed a missing persons report. During the investigation, Kayleen and Menno's cell phones both pinged from the same towers in Lower Etna right before her social media account was deactivated and calls to her phone were going straight to voicemail. Menno told police that Kayleen was alive and just didn't want to be found. The initial investigation was hindered because many speculated that Kayleen was on the run. She had been charged with harassment of an individual and was set to go to court. However, according to her family, there was no warrant for her arrest and no reason for her to disappear of her own accord. Also at the time of her disappearance, she was allegedly in early stages of pregnancy. Her father believes that Mano murdered his daughter after she posted the accusation on Facebook. Another motive, they believe, is to keep Sherry, his long-term girlfriend and mother of his children, from finding out that he had cheated on her and allegedly gotten Kayleen pregnant, and she had reportedly threatened to tell Sherry about the affair. While Mano has not been charged with the disappearance of Kayleen, he has been charged with sending nude pictures of Kayleen, allegedly taken before her disappearance, to her juvenile sister. On April 27, 2021, 46-year-old Mano was arrested and charged with corruption of minors, criminal use of a communication facility, unlawful contact with a minor, and dissemination of sexually explicit materials involving minors. He appeared in court for the charges on March 7, 2022, and changed his non-guilty plea to guilty and was released from jail once again on March 28, 2022. Here is an alleged conversation between Mano and Kayleen's father, where Mano is taunting her father, basically admitting to her murder. There is also allegedly a video available that has been turned over to police where he was recorded telling Kayleen's Uncle Paul that she is swimming with the fish and he would be next. Her family has been frustrated with law enforcement in Etna, stating that by the time Etna police took it seriously, so much time had gone by that they likely had missed crucial evidence. They're hoping for better communication with Allegheny County Police, who have taken over the investigation. His main property has been searched, along with his multiple camp properties. However, no one has been charged with Kayleen's disappearance, and as of April 2022, this case remains unsolved. Patricia Denise Palmer was born in 1962 to Don and Pat Seaver and went by her middle name, Denise. In November of 1981, at the age of 19, Denise was a newlywed and had been married to Randy Palmer, her high school sweetheart, for six months. Denise decided to sell her wedding dress so that she could put money towards buying a house. She placed an ad in the Tulsa World newspaper using her mom's phone number. 
Two days later, her mom Pat received a call about the dress from an older sounding man who said he wanted to buy the dress for his daughter who was about to get married. They made arrangements to meet at her home at 4127 South Sandusky Avenue around noon the next day on November 17th to show the man her daughter's wedding dress. But Pat later decided she had to go shopping at the time of the meeting and told Denise that she would need to meet him. Denise planned to stop by to meet him as she only worked several blocks from her mom's house at the Southland Shopping Center. Her mom told her to be cautious and recommended that she bring a coworker with her just in case the man was up to no good. Pat also told Denise she should hang the dress in the entrance so the man would not have to venture too far inside the home. Denise told her coworkers she would be meeting the man during her lunch break. They were worried and several co-workers offered to go with Denise to her mom's house to meet him, but Denise was not worried and declined their help and headed to her mother's house alone. When the man arrived as scheduled, construction workers in the neighborhood noticed him on the front porch holding a wedding dress. Considering this somewhat odd, the workers paid close attention to the interaction. As a result, they were later able to give the police a detailed description of the man and assist authorities in creating a composite sketch. The suspect was described as a white male in his 40s with salt and pepper colored hair and a red discoloration or birthmark on his face and was wearing gray slacks and a blue windbreaker. The construction workers also described his vehicle as a pristine black over dark blue 1973 or 1974 Chevrolet Impala with an Oklahoma license plate and a CB antenna on the trunk. The vehicle also had a chrome dealer decal on the left side of the bottom of the trunk lid. When Pat called later to see if the man bought the dress, Denise didn't answer the phone. Pat then called her neighbor to stop by and check on Denise. The neighbor arrived to find a horrific scene. Denise's lifeless body was found in the bathtub. She had been sexually assaulted and there were smudges of blood found along the walls of the hallway and on the side of the bathtub. Samples were collected from the crime scene that could have resulted in DNA evidence, but it was stored improperly in test tubes and later deemed unusable. However, a DNA sample was gathered from gum found in the bathtub that is suspected to be the killer's. Her husband, Randy, was devastated by the loss of his wife and stated that she was a very sweet, shy, and trusting person. Years later, police used advanced technology to update the sketch of what the suspect may look like as he aged. Some speculate that her murderer could be Paul Williford. Williford was a newspaper carrier for Tulsa World who described killing as a thrill and confessed to strangling two older women in the Tulsa area. After his release from prison in 1995, after serving only eight years for robbing and almost strangling a woman in her 60s to death, he resumed his attacks of vulnerable elderly women, stating that they had lived long enough. Williford was described as a psychopath. He was again arrested October 21, 2005, after he attacked a 75-year-old woman, but her granddaughter interrupted the attack. He was then sentenced to life in prison for sexual battery, assault, and battery with intent to kill. After his arrest, he confessed to the 2005 murders of 73-year-old Donna Jo Stauffer and 75-year-old Geraldine Lawhorn. Both were originally believed to have died of natural causes because of their age and health history until Williford confessed. Lawhorn's body was exhumed and the medical examiner determined she had been strangled. However, Stauffer was cremated preventing an autopsy. Both women were customers on his paper route. Williford told the Oklahoman in an interview he also killed a young woman that was hitchhiking in 1969 in Arkansas, but authorities have not been able to substantiate that claim. Williford, however, denied murdering Denise and easily confessed to the murder of his other victims, which were all elderly. Also, Denise was killed in 1981, but Williford apparently did not murder victims in the area until the fall of 2005. Williford only had been delivering papers in the region since 2003. 
Although he would have been around 40 years old when Denise was killed, which matches the age of the man witnesses saw at the scene, he does not have a birthmark or skin discoloration on the side of his face. And it is unclear where he was working or living back in 1981. It is also unclear if his DNA was ever tested against the DNA from the recovered gum found in the bathtub. No one has ever been arrested for her murder, and as of April 2022, this case remains unsolved. Rondreas Cortez Phillips was born in 2013 and lived in Lisbon, Louisiana, and went by the nickname Junior. On April 5, 2018, four-year-old Junior was outside playing in the front yard of the home they had just moved into less than a month earlier. His mother, Sheila Phillips, was inside while her boyfriend at the time, Nick Gilbert, was outside working on his truck. The home is in the 100 block of Howard Road in the very rural area of Claiborne Parish, Louisiana, and Nick's family lived nearby as well. Nick told Sheila that he was leaving to go to Homer to check on his brother. When he returned, he asked where Junior was, and Sheila said he was probably at Nick's aunt's home nearby, but when they checked, he was not there. Nick and his family were the last people to see Junior, and when he couldn't be found, his mother called 911. The authorities and many volunteers began searching along with aircraft, drones, tracking dogs from the prison, but found nothing. Search crews spent weeks looking for Junior, and the FBI even became involved in the search a week later. Ponds and wells were drained, but no sign of Junior was ever found. Police interviewed multiple people and followed up on lots of leads. Sadly, the case would go cold. Since 2003, there have been three search warrants executed, but Junior is still missing. The lead detective stated that he doesn't believe his disappearance was random because he went missing from a very rural, secluded area. An age progression image was created to show what Junior may look like at the age of seven in 2020. He has never been located, and as of April 2022, this case remains unsolved. Rochelle Elizabeth Hammond was born in 1988 and went by the nickname Ray. At the age of 30, she moved from Columbus, Ohio to Mosca, Colorado with her mother, Cheryl Moretti. Ray suffered from bipolar disorder and schizophrenia and was taking medication for it and was described as a very trusting person. On August 15, 2019, a few weeks after moving to Mosca, she left home on foot, leaving her ID, medication, and car behind and has never been seen or heard from again. Her mother thinks she might have become a victim of human trafficking, but police say they've found no evidence that this might be the case. Ray was an auto mechanic and painter and left all her tools behind as well. Her mother thought she had to wait 48 hours to report her daughter missing, only to find out that she didn't have to. Once she was reported missing, authorities began searching on foot, by air, and also with search dogs. During the investigation, the detective learned that the day before she went missing, deputies had run into her and others on a vacant lot known as the Devil's Playground in Alamosa and that Ray was with a known female addict in the area. Once the reward for information on her whereabouts was increased to $50,000, several scam calls came in to police. Her mother even hired a private investigator and followed up on rumors that her daughter was being kept by two bad guys nicknamed Double and Diablo. She received texts from burner phones from someone claiming they had seen Ray in December 2019 and that she was being sex trafficked in Massachusetts and California. She has received many messages from people asking for money in exchange for information on where her daughter can be found. In one instance, she was even sent a photoshopped picture of a woman with a man's hand over her mouth. Someone had edited the eyes and face of the woman to match a photo of Ray, and detectives confirmed it was not a real photo. Recently, it was allegedly discovered that Ray had been associating with a dangerous MS-13 gang member. He was recently arrested and charged with several murders of people that owed drug money. 
The Walsh Motel, where a known trap house was run by him and his brother, is where they allegedly killed multiple people and is in walking distance from where Rochelle went missing. It is believed that the rumor of her being harmed by two men may actually be true and that she was killed for owing them money. There is remaining DNA from at least one victim of the men that is being pushed to be tested by the Alamosa police to determine if it belongs to Ray. Ray has never been located, and as of April 2022, this case remains unsolved. Linda Marie Law Jones was born in 1955 to parents Chester Law and Juanita Pitcock. At the age of 20, she had a son with her husband Gary Jones, and the couple lived in Midwest Oklahoma. Linda and Gary had a very rocky relationship, primarily because Gary was a criminal and his half-brother Wayne Kelsey lived with the couple, which caused a lot of tension. On March 15, 1976, Linda's 18-month-old son, Gary Jr., was found at the AMC discount store in Oklahoma City, wandering alone around the aisles and crying. Eyeglasses were found in the grocery store parking lot and turned in by a customer, later determined to belong to Linda by her optometrist. There was no other sign of Linda, who was described as a devoted mother who would have never abandoned her child deliberately. On March 23rd, eight days after she went missing, a couple who were taking a walk stumbled upon a shoe on the bank of a ditch. They then found a woman, deceased in the ditch, wearing only a coat and underwear. It was a remote area of South Edmond on Northeast 164, less than a mile east of Hiwassi Road. Turns out the body belonged to Linda and her cause of death was strangulation. Due to the condition of her body when she was found, police believe that she was most likely killed soon after she was taken. Right before she went missing, her husband, Gary, had just been released from federal prison after serving time for drug trafficking. While there, in April 1975, he witnessed the murder of another inmate and had testified in the trial against four men as a witness to the murder. Some theorize that Linda was killed as retribution against Gary for testifying in the trial. Another theory is that people Gary had been involved with in trafficking drugs had taken and killed her. Either way, her family has always felt that Gary probably knew who had killed her or that he himself was her killer. Another thing that Linda's family found odd is that while Linda was missing and being searched for, Gary and Wayne rented a carpet cleaner and cleaned the carpets of the entire home. This was also strange because they had just moved in days before she disappeared. The two men told police that they left the apartment at 6.45 a.m. the morning of her disappearance to go to Gary's workplace. Wayne reportedly returned to the apartment and had breakfast before leaving the apartment once again. He stated he returned an hour later and Linda and Gary Jr. were gone. At 5.30 p.m. that day, Linda's mother and husband reported her missing, stating that the apartment door was found open and the baby's diaper bag was still inside. Despite the many theories of who is responsible for Linda's murder, as of April 2022, this case remains unsolved. <laughs>